Jerusalem, the holy city. The epicenter of a religious force that has shaped, organized, and dominated Western civilization for 2,000 years. Jerusalem, the birthplace of Christianity. Or so we've been led to believe. But supposing new evidence were to come to light telling an entirely different story. But I hadn't been in it long when I realized that there was something really very big here. Other people were realizing it at that time. Uh, it really did promise to throw a new light on the origins of Christianity, and that was something that always fascinated me. Some 14 miles to the east of Jerusalem, close to the shores of the Dead Sea, this cluster of ruins at Qumran was once the home of the Essenes, a community of Jewish monks. They lived a strict ascetic life, remote from the mainstream of contemporary Judaism. In the words of an ancient writer, without women, without love, without money. In 1947, nearly 2,000 years later, the first of a number of ancient documents, now known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, were discovered in the caves around Qumran by an Arab shepherd boy. At a ceremony in the Library of Congress in Washington, His Grace Mar Samuel, Metropolitan of Jerusalem, unrolls a scroll said to be the oldest known Bible manuscript in the world. A 24-foot document that is virtually the complete book of the prophet Isaiah. Lent to the library by the... When they were brought to public attention some 18 months later, they were hailed as the most important literary find ever made from the time of Christ. Hidden during the Maccabean Wars, the manuscript remained in a cave near Jericho for about 2,000 years to be accidentally discovered by two shepherds in 1947. The scrolls were considered to be so important that they are now kept in a specially designed museum in Jerusalem known as the Shrine of the Book. Important historically, of course, but now also important as a challenge to Christian tradition and belief, as outlined in the New Testament. To some of the scholars who have long been studying the scrolls, the possibility has slowly emerged that it was here at Qumran, among the Essenes, that Jesus was born. Here that he grew up and spent much of his ministry, not as we've always understood in Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Another significant development has been the discovery of a second layer of meaning in the Gospels that throws an entirely new light onto such mysteries as the virgin birth. What really happened to Jesus when he was crucified? And how he apparently rose from the dead? They also put the performances of so-called miracles into a rational and factual context. The scrolls, in fact, have brought a new insight and understanding, not only to the New Testament, but to Christianity itself. They help to demystify the colorful stories and ancient rituals which still form an integral part of Christian worship today. This surprising information has in fact been accessible for over 40 years, but it's never been fully published. 
Reasons have included the natural anxiety of the established church to maintain the traditional basis for its teachings and ministrations. There have also been doubts and conflict among the scholars themselves, which have led to a certain amount of non-committal caution. So what exactly are these new theories, and what kind of credibility can they be given? Some of the more recent ones come from Dr. Barbara Thiering of Sydney University in Australia, now internationally recognized as an authority on the Dead Sea Scrolls. After 20 years of intensive research, she has come to the conclusion that the original scroll scholars have made a significant error in one of their basic assumptions. It's an error in dating, which is crucial to our understanding of the history of the period and to identifying the characters who feature in the scrolls. In simple terms, a date of around 140 BC was determined by general consensus as the period in which the scrolls were written. One of the characters who features largely in them is a man whose life and teaching follow a style and pattern similar to that of Jesus Christ. But if that dating of 140 BC is correct, the scrolls could obviously not be referring to Jesus, who after all wasn't to be born for another hundred years or more. But if that date were found to be incorrect, as Dr. Thiering argues, there's strong reason for believing that the scrolls are in fact written about Jesus himself in a way that completes what is missing from the New Testament. It is from this basic argument that this program stems, and it is the implications that make the new theories both a revelation and a revolution. The scrolls, as we've said, were first found by accident in 1947 in one of the many caves surrounding the ruined buildings of Qumran at the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. Some 800 scrolls, carefully written in Hebrew, had been hidden away in these caves around the time that Jesus was actively spreading his gospel. It's assumed they were put there to prevent them from falling into the hands of the marauding Romans. Some had been rolled up and placed in large jars. Some were laid flat, one on top of the other. Many of these had disintegrated, but about a dozen scrolls that had been rolled up were intact. Some two thirds of them were copies of books of the Old Testament, but the rest were writings entirely new to the eyes of the 20th century. Among them were found these new books that we never heard of before, and they are, are the ones that tell us about the daily life and practice of this community. The Manual of Discipline, as it's called, sometimes called the Community Rule, sets out the rules for these monks. If a monk had laughed loudly, for instance, he was expelled from the sacred meal for a breach of the discipline. Uh, if he had spat or <laughs> if he had fallen asleep in one of their assemblies, any of these things, they were excluded from the sacred meal for this. Also to, to tell a lie or to have any hostility to a fellow monk or anything of that kind. The whole system of penances is set out. If you do one thing, you're excluded for 10 days, another thing for 30 days. Really serious breach, you're excluded for a year from the sacred meal. Presumably they were let into the common meal or they would have starved, but the sacred part of the meal they couldn't go to. And the Manual of Discipline tells us all of that and tells us about their daily life. The monks at Qumran practiced and regarded celibacy as the highest way of life and held that sex and everything connected with it was sinful and unclean. In the Temple Scroll, we read about all these rules uh, that um, caused people to be excluded from a holy place. People with all kinds of diseases, skin diseases, uh, illnesses of various kinds had to go out because the idea was that you had to be perfectly pure physically as well as morally uh, to be a member of the Holy Grade. References to individuals or places in the scrolls never reveal actual names. With plenty of groups seeking to destroy these active religious sects, it was safer to use code names or descriptions in case the scrolls fell into enemy hands. 
One of the principal characters who appears in much of the writing is known simply as the teacher of righteousness. A stern ascetic, he was at the time something of a hero figure, spreading the message that the world was about to be destroyed for its sins in a final fiery judgment from on high. Those who followed him were known as the sons of light. Those who didn't were called the sons of darkness. According to the scrolls, the followers of the teacher of righteousness gradually began to desert their leader to join another teacher who was advocating a less demanding, less rigorous kind of lifestyle. This man appears under a variety of names. One of them was the man of a lie, which could imply that his birth was illegitimate. Another was the wicked priest, wicked because he flouted the strict purity laws of the Essenes and disregarded their taboos. He and his followers became known as the seekers after smooth things. They had chosen the easy way. Most scholars have followed the line that the man of a lie and the wicked priest were two different people and that they must have lived sometime before 100 BC, certainly before Jesus was born. But Dr. Thiering now questions this assumption, maintaining that the consensus dating is incorrect. Furthermore, these two titles could very well have applied to one and the same person. There was the teacher. He preached a coming fiery judgment, fire and brimstone, almost those terms are found. He said things like, the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and he called people vipers. He practiced baptism, and he was in the wilderness of Judea, and that's an area only about seven miles square. When you disregard the consensus dating and the sometimes, I think, quite flimsy reasons for it, and when you take notice of a very possible interpretation of one of the dates in the scrolls themselves, then there really is strong reason for supposing that the teacher of righteousness was John the Baptist. Everything about him was the same once you remove that wrong dating. Well now, if the teacher of righteousness were John the Baptist, then the rival uh, teacher who had separated from him and whose uh, party broke the purity rules would almost certainly be the Christians and the leader would be Jesus. There's plenty of academic argument about the identity of these characters. Not all the scholars agree, and certainly they find Dr. Thiering's interpretations problematical, to say the least. That's not appealing. Professor John Strugnell of the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Harvard University is one of the original team of scholars and is currently in charge of research on the scrolls. The um, teacher of righteousness, we don't know his name, but uh, he would seem to have been a candidate for high priest of Israel uh, at some time between 155 and 150 BC. Um, the wicked priest would probably be um, um, the successful, the man who made it and got himself elected as high priest, uh, either uh, Jonathan or Simon. Now, uh, uh, we still don't really have the evidence to know that, but it's really not so important to know the names as to know the political circumstances that they live, uh, lived on. Uh, He's going to have to put together the bits of information and see who what his daughter. Father Jerome Murphy O'Connor of the École Biblique Jerusalem the is the author of numerous articles on Qumran history. And the candidate at the moment, anyway, that seems to fit the portrait best is Jonathan, who was the second of the Maccabean brothers. And, of course, that is very important because it is he who establishes the date of the high priest, of the uh, teacher of righteousness. We don't have enough information about the teacher of righteousness in himself to be able to pin him down to a historical figure. We need the narrowing effect of the identification of the wicked priest in order to be able to identify the teacher of righteousness. Professor Geza Vamish of Oxford University, a scholar and one of the translators of the scrolls, admits to a little private speculation. I feel uh, somewhat uh, responsible for uh, the theory uh, that uh, the wicked priest is identified uh, usually as uh, Jonathan McBeer's 
sometimes it's Simon, sometimes it's the Hesmonim, uh, priest king uh, Alexander Genius. Because in fact, I invented this story um, back in 1952. Uh, at which time it was considered as widely unlikely. What? A, a, a holy Maccabean figure um, casted as uh, the wicked priest. Well, it has become a fairly common theory, and uh, well, uh, I plead guilty to that. And in my view, uh, that of Jonathan Maccabeus uh, fits best, but I would not uh, commit suicide if somebody were able to demonstrate that this is not the case. One such somebody is Dr. Barbara Thiering, one of the new generation of scholars now challenging the original dating that sets these events before the birth of Christ and finding a whole new significance in the scrolls. The first thing you notice when you read the Dead Sea Scrolls is the number of parallels with Christianity there are in them. Everybody noticed that right from the start. It was the reason for the sensation of the scrolls. There you've got a group of Jews living at the same time as Jesus and the disciples, uh, only some miles away from Jerusalem, who were doing all the same things. They too had a sacred meal of bread and new wine. They had baptisms, they had community of property. They expected a coming fiery judgment. They looked forward to the coming of the Messiahs. They even called themselves by the same names. The name The Way keeps appearing in the scrolls as, as a, really as a name for the members. And we know from Acts that the early Christians called themselves the sect of the way. The word the church appears in the scrolls and their leaders were bishops. They called themselves sons of light and that term also appears in the New Testament. At point after point, the two communities seem to be the same in organisation and in structure. And yet the Qumran community are certainly not Christian. There's no mention of Jesus, apparently, and it does not seem to be Christian. And further, there are very big differences between them. The Qumran community insisted on the strict observance of the laws of Moses. And we know that the Christians didn't do that. And further, the Qumran community were priestly. They believed that the priests were superior and the laity had to obey the priests. And yet, it is true that you have to allow for these similarities. It seems to me, it has seemed over 20 years of study, that Qumran scholars were not really doing justice, were not facing squarely the evidence for the parallels or dealing with the problem of the differences. There'd been a sort of sacred ground effect, that is, don't tread near what touches Christianity. They were really avoiding the issue, or it was taken up in such a sensational way uh, that it really couldn't be treated seriously. And it, after looking at it, the one thing that comes out of it is that it's not destructive to Christianity. It's true that it was claimed that it destroyed the uniqueness of Christianity. But when you really go through it and face up squarely to what's there, the end result is liberating. The result may be that we have discovered what Christianity really was about to start off with, and we have a quite new perspective on it, freed from the magic, from the children's stories, from all the accretions of centuries. Now, there is only one really uh, objective piece of evidence, apparently, that can be brought against this reconstruction. The reconstruction depends on careful observation of everything the texts say. But the paleographical judgment has been brought in to say that we have got to date the teacher uh, before 100 BC. Paleography is the science of dating scripts which uh, are not otherwise dated by the stage of evolution that their script had reached. And it has been said that the uh, judgment on that prevents the reconstruction that I'm putting forward. The argument rests very firmly on what can be learnt from the science of dating manuscripts by the way the letters are drawn. For instance, if 
we picked up a book in which the letter S was written as an F, we could confidently say that it came from the 17th century and could not be a modern book. Hebrew letters evolved in a similar way. In a formal script, or book hand as it's known, it's possible to tell that a script is either early, say 100 BC, or later, say after 1 AD. Some of the scholars dismiss Dr. Thiering's new time frame out of hand and stick firmly to their original dating. All these suggestions, um, to me, are ruled out big, uh, on the grounds of paleography, of the dating of writings, you know, writings that refer to the wicked priest or writings that refer to the teacher of righteousness um, are nevertheless clearly written um, 50, 60, 70 years earlier. So when you get down, uh, they're written about 60 BC. So that eliminates, I think, the Jesus suggestion, the John the Baptist one. Now, Jesus was born in 4 BC, John perhaps about the same time. His ministry took place in, say, between 27 and 30 AD. And so for me, as for most scholars, the major problem is that documents written in the first century BC cannot really refer to events that took place in the first century AD, you know, 40, 50, 60 years later. That's the major problem. If you could prove that those documents were, say, written in the year 50 or 60, then that they might refer to the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of John the Baptist, I think is extremely possible. Possible, but how probable? While the older scholars cling to their original theories and dates, newcomers to the field, like Dr. George Brooke of Manchester University and Dr. Yes, Philip Davis of Sheffield University are a good deal more open-minded. It's essentially a very simple one. If you have two kinds of writing, which you can date more or less absolutely, and you have a, a range of scripts that you can't date, uh, but the forms and the shapes of the letters fall between the earlier and the later date, then you can say with reasonable certainty that the script you're dealing with falls between those two. It seems to me that some Qumran scholars have been too precise in the way they have dated scrolls on the basis of handwriting. Uh, it seems to me unlikely that you can date any particular hand um, to within 25 years, as some scholars have suggested, uh, simply because uh, an old scribe will be writing at the same time as a young scribe, and we must allow for a measure of development in the handwriting from old to young, so that um, one finds the uh, different kinds of handwriting could exist contemporaneously. I myself feel that far too much emphasis has been placed on paleography and whilst in a general way we can certainly establish that the writings belong to the era between the second century BC and the first century AD, which is important in establishing that they are not medieval forgeries, uh, it becomes very dangerous to use them as secure evidence uh, when you're reducing a period to, say, within 20 or 25 years. There is a margin of error of plus or minus 25 years, and most scholars would recognize that. And I, I think statistically that means you've actually got 50 years each way because of the plus or minus factor. That's hardly worthwhile. That's such a big gap that paleography should certainly not be used as a first argument in dating anything. It should only be used as a control or a supporting piece of evidence. Dr. Thiering makes an even stronger challenge. One of the scripts on which so much reliance was placed as far as dates are concerned was written in a semi-cursive kind of handwriting. No reliable date can ever be given to this kind of script, and yet the scholar who originally assessed the date failed to tell the others that it was in fact written in a semi-cursive script. He simply gave a date, which was accepted by other scholars without question, and never checked. 
Now, all paleographers know that you cannot give a firm dating on a semi-cursive. It's a kind of handwriting, uh, more like a handwriting than a book hand. Most of the scripts are a book hand and you, you can date them. But you just cannot possibly date on a semi-cursive. They, they all say that. And yet, because of this general statement in the earlier book, it seems that quite a lot of writers took that as a fixed date and went on from there without checking for themselves what kind of a script it was. And that really was a very unscientific procedure. A whole edifice has been built on that. So that when you look a little more widely and you don't have too simple a view and you take into account all the facts, there really is no paleographical objection to the interpretation of the teacher of righteousness as John the Baptist and the rival teacher as Jesus. As you'd expect, this hypothesis has met with plenty of opposition, but it's also attracting supporters among the newer generation of scholars. They find her carefully researched theories bold and original. The theory of Barbara's theory represents a new shift in the direction of Qumran research, which has been stuck in the doldrums for a long period. And this was the place, I think, where the prayer... Her research has not been purely academic. On her many visits to Qumran, she's been able to relate some of the detail contained in the scrolls to the life and habits of the community that once occupied this bleak, inhospitable crag overlooking the low-lying valley of the Dead Sea. The original Qumran scholars were comparatively young men when they started their research. They are now rather old. Their theories are coming more and more under scrutiny and being challenged. But some of the fundamental questions that Dr. Thiering and others are asking are being deflected, if not actually obstructed, by the incredible delay in the publishing of a large number of scrolls. These delays have been called the academic scandal of the century. After all, it is now over 40 years since the scrolls were first discovered. What then are the reasons? Whether we can speak of reasons for it, I'm not sure. Sorry, these are just facts. And the facts of the case are as follows. The first manuscripts were discovered in 1947. All of them were published by 1955. Then in the early 1950s, nine more caves were located and manuscript fragments were produced uh, in these various caves, especially in cave 4 and in cave 11. Now, cave 4 uh, necessitated the creation of an editorial team. This team was set up in 1953, in 1954, uh, 34 years ago. They plan, according to their present uh, calculation, to issue 16 volumes of texts uh, from K4. Of these 16 volumes, so far, three have appeared. Uh, yes, th this is uh, one of my uh, the crosses that I bear, that I, I am at the moment in charge of getting the unpublished manuscripts from, uh, the, from the Qumran caves published. Um, it's the work of publication uh, from of the fragmentary manuscripts has been very slow. Although there is now a promise that everything will be completed by the year 2000, I think that this is the second millennium and I will believe in it when I see it. We first um, started working here at the museum on fragmentary manuscripts in 1952, and we're still at it. Um, we, uh, we're not as slow as people, uh, as some people think. Uh, as a matter of fact, there have been some 15 volumes published in the, in the intervening um, 50, um, 35 years. But uh, there are about, um, 20 volumes still to come. According to my 
unofficial and slightly uh, light-hearted calculation. At the present rate, uh, the final publication uh, would be after 2134. We have had many reasons uh, for interruption in our work, such as the uh, complete lack of money, um, uh, such as the um, The, the various wars and things like this that one gets in the Middle East. An extraordinary state of affairs, you might think, 40 years down the track from the first discovery of the scrolls. But whatever the reasons for the delays, let's consider the implications of Dr. Thiering's case for a new dating of the scrolls. First, we must accept that there's been a paleographical error in the setting of approximate dates. If her dating is correct, there's good evidence for identifying the teacher of righteousness as John the Baptist and the wicked priest as Jesus Christ. The story would then unfold like this. Jesus and John the Baptist, who were together in 29 AD, were the two messiahs expected by the Essenes. Jesus, the kingly messiah of the line of David, and John, the priestly messiah. John was prophesying an imminent fiery judgment, which would destroy all the sons of darkness, including the Romans, who were then occupying the Holy Land. He and his followers, the sons of light, expected Jesus to become the king of a world purged of all evil men, leaving only Jews who had been baptized. John would become its high priest. Their forebears had been baptizing Jews in the diaspora, the world outside Palestine, for many years. They had hundreds and thousands of members who hoped eventually to become a single community, a kingdom of God. Jesus didn't exactly conform to the plan. With the support of members of the diaspora, he turned against all the ritual washings, the Sabbath observances, the special Jewish practices. In the words of his enemies, he committed abominable defilements and flouted the law. They wrote this about him in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, you've only got to look up your New Testament to discover that Jesus was accused of drunkenness. It says so in Matthew 11. The reason is simply that he was not an ascetic. The Qumran monks drank only new wine and strict sobriety was their rule. Anyone who drank fermented wine would be accused of drunkenness by their very bigoted standards. He attacked the financial practices of the kingdom of God. They were charging money for baptism. People paid half a shekel as a ransom for their soul. He overturned the tables of the money changers because, of course, when they brought in the foreign currency, they had to change it into Jewish currency to retain it here. And so there were money changers. And he said, do not make my father's house a shop. He meant, uh, do not sell salvation. He objected to the selling of religious salvation for money. And he said, we give salvation by grace and freely and without charge. He objected also uh, to the giving of forgiveness of sins for money. He also claimed that he could become a high priest, the light. But John the Baptist was supposed to be the light because he was of priestly birth. It was John who stood in front of the menorah, the multi-branched candlestick that stood for the temple. This gave substance to his claim to be the light. Jesus was not of priestly birth, but declared, I am the light of the world. And he put on the white vestments of the high priest. By this he was saying that the Jewish priesthood was unnecessary and that every layman was a priest in the eyes of God. It was this act of defiance that caused his enemies to call him the wicked priest, meaning the anti-priest. Christmas Eve in Bethlehem. 
the annual celebration of perhaps the most significant pointer to the divinity upon which the Christian faith is founded. The miracle of the virgin birth, the label of the Son of God, the Immaculate Conception, the signs and symbols of this great cosmic event have given people faith and hope in the possibility of divine intervention in the affairs of earthbound man. It is one of the cornerstones of the great religious empire of Western civilization, built up over the past 2,000 years. And yet, there have always been questions, even an instinctive skepticism about such a happening. Perhaps it is now time, with the aid of the Dead Sea Scrolls, to re-examine the whole basis of this phenomenon that has for so long been part of our religious mythology. The Essenes had the custom that certain men must marry those who had to continue their family line. The highest Essenes, of course, had no sex at all but uh, the men in their second order used to leave the monastery from time to time to cohabit with their wives and then went back again. The women in such marriages had the status of a, of a nun. Now, the name of a nun in the Hellenistic world was a virgin. It meant, of course, both a woman who was physically virgin and also a dedicated woman. And these women went through three stages. First of all, their vow of dedication when they were physically virgin. But then after a period, they were betrothed to the man they were intended to marry. But the rule was that they must stay apart as long as possible. The betrothal period should last as long as possible because for the Essenes, sex was sinful and it should be avoided as far as necessary. Then after such a long period, they had a wedding and then sex began and a three years trial marriage took place. If after the three years the woman became pregnant, then they had a second wedding. And this was for good because there was to be a child and divorce was absolutely forbidden by the Essenes. And they had a re rule also that there was to be no intercourse during pregnancy. Now all of this would explain very well the virgin birth. There's always been a striking inconsistency in that the two Gospels who say that Jesus was born of a virgin also give him a genealogy which say that he was descended from King David through his father, Joseph. And this is very difficult to reconcile. But the actual history would have been something like this. Mary was betrothed to Joseph according to the rules of the Essenes. And during the betrothal period, they came together prematurely. It says in the New Testament that if a man has a virgin, that is if the betrothal period is on and his passions become strong, then let them marry. Mary conceived and it could be said by a play on words that a virgin had conceived because she was still legally in the status of a virgin. And all of this makes quite good sense, uh, a down-to-earth sense it's true, if you take into account the material that has always been available from Josephus about the marriage customs of the Essenes. This interpretation doesn't fit easily into the jigsaw for everyone. The Gospels, for instance, maintain that Jesus was conceived through the intervention of the Holy Spirit. But in the scrolls, as Dr. Thiering points out, certain people were regarded as incarnations of gods angels and spirits. It was a way of speaking to refer to Joseph as the Holy Spirit. Similarly, the angel Gabriel was a real person, as were all the other angels and spirits in the story. This takes away the mystery and anomaly of the birth of Jesus and makes him a normal human being, born through the usual biological process. Barbara Thiering's hypothesis on the virgin birth is difficult for me to evaluate because I, as a historian, would argue in favor of the literal truth of the virgin birth. In Judaism, there are stories of miraculous births, you know, Sarah at the age of 90 giving birth to a child. There's no tradition in Judaism of, of, uh, of virgin births, nothing that would prepare us in Judaism.
we are now in the realm not of of history as we understand history. We're in the realm of belief, of pious legend, pious myth. That, I think, is almost universally recognized by scholars in this connection. And pious myths which, by which, which have formed a very important part of our Christian, our Christian tradition for centuries, for which we must have every respect. I think uh, I myself side with those scholars and uh, other Christians who would wish to assert that Jesus had a natural father and that what is significant in the birth stories in Matthew and Luke is that the early church uh, believed very strongly that there was more to this birth than it being just a natural birth. Uh, and uh, I would uh, hold the position that the more to this birth uh, is very significant and should be taken uh, very seriously. Not that, uh, that the uh, human paternity of Jesus is denied, but that the divinity in all of us is uh, encouraged. This is the gospel of the Lord. This myth, of course, is very much the basis of the Christian religion, with its symbolism of the supernatural and the divine, providing something more than the simple story of a remarkable but strictly mortal human being. But the Dead Sea Scrolls reveal facts that cut directly across the magic and miracles, providing the 20th century with a more realistic basis for the perpetuation of a moral and spiritual code by which we can live and survive. The clues are there. They need to be carefully collated and analyzed. To do so, we must look at the historical background and the interpretations that can be drawn from the scrolls themselves and take a new perspective on the Gospels. remember, of course, what theologians have been telling us for a long time, that the stories in the New Testament come to us through a first century worldview, a worldview where the earth was flat, you had a three-story universe with uh, hell below and flat earth and heaven above. That's why the story of the ascension of Jesus is told in that way. He went up into heaven because heaven was the higher layer up there. This is the wilderness, as it is today, and not too dissimilar from the way it was 2,000 years ago. A few modern roads, an Israeli relay station, villages and towns here and there, and a steady trickle of tourists. This beautiful monastery at Mar Saba could well have been one of the network of centers that formed part of the Jewish monk's desert before it became a Christian monastery. Situated about halfway between Jerusalem and Qumran, it would have provided a convenient stopover for travelers between the two religious centers. The area was also the dwelling place of many hermits who lived in the small caves dotted across the cliff faces. The word hermit comes from the Greek herimos, which actually means wilderness. The Dead Sea Scrolls, coming from these Jewish monks and hermits, can now throw a fascinating new light on some of the familiar writings of the Gospels. For instance, 
when the scripture tells us that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? Is it just a colorful literary metaphor, or does it have some hidden connotation? They used the letters of the Hebrew alphabet to distinguish people according to whether they were A, B, C, or D. And in Hebrew, that's Aleph, Beit, Gimel, and Dalet. And the final grade was marked by the letter Kof. And the meaning of Kof is the eye of a needle. And I am interpreting the saying about the camel going through the eye of a needle in these terms. Not only did they use the letters for each of the grades, but they also used the first four letters for the broad grades, the equivalent of A, B, C, and D. Uh, uh, Aleph, or A, stood for the priests. Beit, or B, stood for the Levites. And the third letter was Gimel in the Hebrew alphabet. And that was for the monks, the broad grade of monks. Well, now, the meaning of Gimel is camel. And so, uh, when a camel went through the eye of a needle, it meant that a member of grade Gimel uh, went through Kof. That is, that a monk graduated. The meaning of that was that a, a monk had graduated, and uh, he came up here and uh, had that ceremony. He was then a fully-fledged scribe. He knew how to write, and he could copy the Qumran texts. How many of us accept the teachings of the Bible at their face value, without pausing to ask just what these poetic and unfamiliar metaphors really signify? The Dead Sea Scrolls have revealed a new way to understanding the Gospels through the use of a method known as the Pesha Technique. We find that at Qumran they had a very unusual definition of scripture. They believed that scripture contained two levels. On the surface it had general, moral and spiritual meanings. For instance, the psalm said that the righteous will prosper and the wicked will suffer. And that obviously refers to all righteous people and all wicked people. But for the Qumran interpreter, who is writing a special category of books called the Peshir, the Hebrew word is Peshir, which means interpretation. And he's going through Old Testament scripture and finding in it special meanings, historical meanings, meanings concerning actual facts. And he does it by the technique of giving precise meanings to things which look as if they're general, making particulars out of universals. For him, when it says the righteous, that means the righteous teacher. And when it says the wicked, that means the wicked priest. And so he's able to see in the psalm a prediction that the teacher will prosper and that the wicked priest will suffer. Now, in the New Testament, there is a similar view of Old Testament scripture, that on the surface, it looks as if it's talking about things in the past or making general statements, but in fact, that it is talking in detail about what happened to Jesus and the disciples. There are many claims that the Old Testament is prophesying detailed events that Jesus performed. You've only got to carry that one step further to form a hypothesis that if a group holding such a view of scripture set out to write a new scripture, they might set it up with the same structure. That on the surface, it said one sort of thing, general, moral, spiritual statements, stories, parables, miracles. But for those with special knowledge, special information, and who looked for a, an exact meaning, who looked for a peace share, it would yield something else. The surface meaning would not be invalid, but there would be an additional meaning, a history referring to detailed uh, figures or people or parties. Jesus himself gave a clue to this intention. He said to his disciples, who were privy to the inner meaning of things, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, Everything is in parables. A large amount of space in the Gospels is filled up with accounts of quite extraordinary actions by Jesus. On one occasion at a wedding, he turned water into wine. 
He walked on water, he raised the dead, he caused 5,000 people to be fed with five loaves. These stories have a strong supernatural element and the odd thing about them is that they don't appear anywhere else in the New Testament and nor do these remarkable actions find any record outside the New Testament. Moreover, they don't go with the figure of Jesus that is presented in the rest of the New Testament, a humble suffering figure who accepted suffering even unto death and didn't use supernatural powers. Let's take a closer look at one of these so-called miracles, using the Pesha technique to find this double level of meaning. According to the Gospel of St. John, one of Jesus' first miracles was at a wedding feast where there was no wine for the guests to drink. The Gospel states, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. The ruler of the feast tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was. By applying the Pesher technique, the true meaning of the story emerges. We know that the Qumran community gave water baptism to those known as low-grade members and reserved the wine, the communal sacred drink, for full members only. Low-grade members, such as Gentiles, women, even married men, were excluded from taking the wine. Turning water into wine simply signified that Jesus was now offering the privilege of full membership to those who had not previously been entitled to it. From that time on, the Gentiles, the women, and the married men were able to receive communion, the sacred meal of bread and wine. It was scandalous to the Jewish monks to have unholy people outside their community receiving the highest privileges, and they attacked Jesus and the scrolls for defiling the holiness of their monastery. This story is, in effect, describing the origins of the Christian Holy Communion service. According to Dr. Thierry, every one of the miracles has a rational explanation like this. There are, she maintains, no miracles in the New Testament. The story of the feeding of the 5,000, or the loaves and fishes, is the account of the first ordination of Christian ministers, which is why it's given such prominence in all four Gospels. The loaves were Levites, that is, assistant priests, who helped in the temple and who gave out the holy loaves. What was happening in the story was that Jesus was giving the powers of Levites, who had to be born into a special tribe, to ordinary laymen, to common people who didn't have this privileged birth. He was allowing ordinary married men to give out the sacred loaves at the commun communion meal, so that it was an ordination of ministers. And then the two fish were Gentile monks, who were giving their holiness to the unclean married men. They were called fish for two reasons. One, by a play on the Hebrew letters, Dalet and Gimel. Uh, they were grade Gimel because they were celibates, that's the third grade, and grade Dalet, the fourth grade, or D, because they were unclean, Gentiles were both. And the two letters together made the Hebrew word dag, which means fish. And further, they were baptized by being uh, made to go through salt water they had to go right down into the sea through salt water and were dragged up onto the deck of a ship which stood for Noah's Ark. And then the ship sailed up a short uh, distance, a channel to a water gate, and then they descended from the deck onto the dry land of salvation. And straight after this story, it says in the Gospels that Jesus walked on water. And that also depends on the same imagery because with this drama of salvation, the priest who was to baptize them uh, had to get on the boat too, and he wasn't going to go through the salt water and get all wet, and so he walked to the boat across a jetty and arrived dry on board ship. And it was probably an old anti-priestly joke that a priest walks on water, that he was more privileged than other people. But the point of the story is that Jesus walked on water so that he was claiming to be a priest.
uh, he took the part of a priest and walked across the jetty. And that had the same meaning as the miracle of the loaves, because he, as an ordinary layman, who was not born into the priestly tribe, uh, was acting as if he were a priest. And so both miracles tell the same thing, that in the Christian ministry, ministry is given to ordinary men, ordinary people, and not to those with a special privilege of birth. The Gospels are written at two levels. They are superbly crafted. There's an outer level, which is intended for the babes, for those who have the elementary doctrine, a concept that's quite often found in the New Testament. Children need miracle stories. They need general moral lessons. And a large number of the followers of the Christian church were in that position, and the outer level is meant for them. But in addition to that, there is an inner history, a concealed history, what actually happened to Jesus and the disciples. And those who read it by the Pesha method will discover that history. And in the course of it, they'll discover what their religion was all about. It was not supernatural, it didn't rely on miracles, but it was an, a, a movement which reformed an existing religion which took from Judaism its best elements, its high monotheism, its high ethical standard, while at the same time rejecting what Judaism had degenerated into at this time. An obsessive concern with an imaginary holiness, rejection of outsiders, rejection of Gentiles, rejection of everybody who they didn't think was perfectly pure and holy, financial exploitation also. This, the early Christian church arose from within this movement, the new Israel, the kingdom of the Jews, and reformed it. And as all reformers do, Jesus was met with hostility, polemic, exaggeration, the sort of abuse that is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which on this interpretation are the documents of the losing party. What also comes out of this is a complete history of the church before Jesus. It was founded in the time of Herod the Great, some 70 years earlier, not in Jerusalem, but here at Qumran. In the Gospels, the Greek text uses two different forms of the word Jerusalem, either a singular or a plural. Now, to the general reader, that just doesn't mean anything. But to the exact reader, it means there's a difference between two kinds of Jerusalem. And if you follow that through, you find that it works, that the singular form of Jerusalem refers to the literal Jerusalem, some 25 kilometers by road away from here, or 14 miles in a straight line, while the plural form refers to here, the new Jerusalem for those who had been exiled here. When the priests from the Jerusalem temple found themselves here, they clung to the idea that uh, they belonged, they truly belonged in Jerusalem, and so they transferred Jerusalem to here in their thinking. This was the new Jerusalem. And in this toy city, in a way, a model city, uh, they acted out as if they were in the real Jerusalem, calling the sanctuary area the temple and the rooms outside at the city, and the aqueduct, uh, the Kidron, which of course runs down between the, uh, the uh, Mount Zion and the Mount of Olives. Uh, they call that the Kidron because it runs in the same direction as the true Kidron. The monastery on the eastern side, uh, they called the Mount of Olives. And so they, uh, in fantasy, reproduced the whole of the city of Jerusalem in this tiny place. They, when they talked about the city, they actually meant this small area here. Uh, this, certainly the literature supports the idea that they thought of themselves as a new Jerusalem. There's plenty in the literature that supports that. But when that theme was followed through quite consistently, uh, then the word Jerusalem in the plural refers to here, to their new Jerusalem. The original Qumran community was made up of priests who had been exiled from the Jerusalem temple, together with their lay workers. They built Qumran as their substitute sanctuary and established a strict monastic lifestyle. And then towards the end of the first century BC, they entered a new phase. 
by this time they had become involved with other Jews who were not strictly Essenes but who did want to try the ascetic life. And when the two groups came together, they developed the idea of going out into the, di into the diaspora where there were hundreds and thousands of Jews living, exiled from Palestine, but um, wanting to keep a sense of being Jewish, but at the same time lapsing from the Jewish faith, giving up the ritual laws and the food laws and uh, becoming rapidly amalgamated with the Greek world. By 6 AD, tensions had risen to breaking point in the kingdom of the Jews. The Romans had imposed the direct rule of procurators. The country was under an occupying Roman army who could be tactlessly insensitive to the religious scruples of the Jews. When the Romans imposed a census requiring a record of property of all Jews for the purpose of taxation, it was the signal for revolt. A number of guerrilla leaders began training armies in the wilderness of Judea. One of them was Judas the Galilean, a leader of the Zealots. One of the most significant of the Dead Sea Scrolls is titled The War of the Sons of Light with the Sons of Darkness. It describes how the Zealots, with the help of God, will destroy the Romans, called the Kittim. On the day when the Kittim fall, there shall be battle and terrible carnage before the God of Israel. For that shall be the day appointed from ancient times for the battle of destruction of the sons of darkness. The Zealots had carried out a kind of sporadic guerrilla warfare against the Romans for a number of years. But eventually, when the Romans decided enough was enough, they set out to wipe out the whole of Judaism, including the Essenes at Qumran, and the Zealots, who'd taken refuge in one of Herod's old pleasure palaces at Matsara. In 74 AD, as the Romans advanced to the clifftop stronghold, 960 zealots committed suicide rather than letting themselves be captured and having to submit to Rome. Almost 50 years earlier, in 29 AD, Jesus had been a member of a party called the Twelve Apostles, which included Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot. They had come together because they were all opposed to the priestliness and purification practices of the Baptist. But they eventually split into two groups, the Zealots who were against Rome and wanted to destroy all pagans in a holy war, and the Christians, the followers of Jesus, who believed that they should love rather than hate their enemies, including the Romans, and preached peace with Rome. To Judas Iscariot, the zealot, it seemed that Jesus had gone over to the enemy and deserved the punishment that was set down in the temple scroll, an earlier writing of the community. If a man betrays his people to the Gentiles, he should be crucified. It was therefore because of his political beliefs that his own party turned against Jesus. This would be the place where the debates between Jesus and Judas Iscariot took place that uh, were are represented in the Gospels in the form of the temptations between Jesus and Satan. Satan was a pseudonym for the zealot leader. And at this point, they had all separated from the priestly Essenes at Qumran, uh, agreeing with them on lay dominance, but the political issue became a primary one. The zealot here, looking at Jerusalem in the distance, would have easily made it their planning headquarters. This is the place from which they plan to take over not only Jerusalem, but the whole of the world. And as they stood here and looked over there, the two leaders debated on how this was to be done. Judas, Satan, said, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. The meaning of that was, let's have a political alliance. 
whereby I am the superior leader and you are the subordinate lay leader and you will recognize that and together we will gain empire. It was a plan as big as that. But Jesus rejected that plan. He refused to bow down and worship Satan, to acknowledge the superiority of one who wanted to use zealot military methods. His party would, would take over, would, would uh, rule the world, but by love and by spiritual power and not by force of arms. No, 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 no. <laughs> Jerusalem has long been a tourist attraction, offering a number of signposts to the early history of Christianity. Some of them, however, spring more from 20th century opportunism than sound historical facts. This much visited tomb is claimed to be the place where the body of Lazarus was lying before Jesus brought him back to life. <coughs> there could, however, be a different version. When people joined the Qumran community and became initiated, they were given life. That was the image that was used. It was thought of as being born again. They were given life. And that meant that when they were expelled from the community, they died symbolically. Excommunication was spiritual death. Now, I think that the Gospels are telling us, when you interpret them by the Pesha method, that this symbol of spiritual death was taken so seriously that when a man was excommunicated, he was dressed in his grave clothes, uh, placed on a bier, carried out and put in his own grave or own burial cave and left there uh, as if buried for several days and then when this period was over uh, sent away out into the world and from the community point of view he was spiritually dead now if a person was raised from the dead in this metaphor then his excommunication was being lifted he was being forgiven and was allowed back in in the Gospel period, we have the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead by Jesus. It's an extraordinary story told in a whole chapter in John's Gospel, never referred to in the other Gospels, nor anywhere else. And yet, according to John's Gospel, it was a major event, and the Jews were so upset about it, they went around plotting to destroy both Jesus and Lazarus afterwards. It would make much better sense if the point of it was not a literal miracle, but the fact that Jesus and Lazarus were involved somehow in a uh, political party or movement, and Lazarus had been excommunicated for his uh, sympathy with the uh, outlook of Jesus. He was, he must have been a leader of some kind and was placed in a burial cave and Jesus came and lifted his excommunication. That, of course, is a quite different interpretation of the miracle, but one that makes very good sense and is, is consistent with this uh, approach to the Gospels as giving us a concealed political history, which is what I'm suggesting. the two most significant events in the story of Christianity are the crucifixion and the resurrection. Here at least is the symbolism of divinity, of life everlasting, the survival of the spirit after the suffering and death of the flesh. The exact nature of the crucifixion and evidence of the resurrection has, of course, often been challenged. But the Pesha technique of reading the Gospels could provide new facts and possibilities that may not have been considered before. Crucifixion was an intensely cruel method of execution. It took days, even weeks, for the victim to die. Pilate, when told that Jesus was dead after only a few hours on the cross, 
expressed considerable surprise. Matthew's Gospel says that when Jesus was first put on the cross, he was offered poison, wine mixed with gall, that is, poison, but he didn't take it. At 3 p.m. he was offered a sponge dipped in vinegar. Two later Christian writings say that it was poison and vinegar. And in any case, the background in Psalm 69, they gave me poison for my food and vinegar, vinegar for my thirst, would suggest the extra ingredient. Jesus had just said, I thirst. The meaning would be that he was ready for the poison. In the Hellenistic world, suicide was considered a noble method of ending intolerable suffering. Socrates had drunk the hemlock, and on Matsada in 74 AD, the zealots had committed mass suicide rather than submit to the Roman yoke. After six hours on the cross and in despair, the cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was ready to end the suffering. He drank it and then the Greek says he gave up the spirit. Now the exact meaning of that is that he ceased to have the indwelling spirit and he became defiled. He had lost purity, he became defiled, but it actually means no more than that he had lost consciousness. The two so-called thieves who were crucified beside Jesus were in fact zealots. They were known as thieves because of the way they'd illegally put money into supporting an uprising. The Romans did not execute people simply for theft. Jesus, of course, had also been accused of zealotry, of being a military king of the Jews, and his own party had turned him in. With the next day being the Sabbath, the rule was that bodies could not be left on the crosses overnight. So they were taken down, and the legs of the two zealots were broken to prevent them from escaping from the tomb where they were to be buried alive. It looked as though Jesus was already dead. He was wrapped in grave clothes and put in the tomb with the other two. But the poison he'd swallowed had merely rendered him unconscious. His friends, aware of what had happened, and with the connivance of the two zealots, managed to smuggle in among the grave clothes a strong purgative of aloes mixed with myrrh to help soothe the internal inflammation. During the night, one of the men who were buried with him squeezed the aloes into Jesus' mouth. The poison was expelled and Jesus began to recover. The three of them succeeded in moving the stone enough to give a signal to Mary Magdalene, who had been waiting outside. She fetched Peter and some of the other disciples and together they managed to get Jesus out and carry him away. In the Acts of the Apostles, there are numerous occasions when Jesus appeared to his disciples, to Peter and especially to Paul. In Corinth, for instance, he appeared to Paul one night and said, don't be afraid, I have many people in this city. In Caesarea, he appeared to Paul and said, take courage, Paul, because you have to go to Rome. These are real appearances of the real Jesus. He stayed with his friends and was with them and they were able to meet with him for guidance and direction. When it says that he descended into heaven, the meaning is, by the, in the exact sense, uh, that he went into the monastery sanctuary and was kept there because it was heaven, because the priests and Levites were thought of as gods and angels. They had been entered into and possessed by heavenly spirits, and they were talked about in that way. In the Gospel of Philip, the newly discovered Gospel of Philip, it says, those who believe that Jesus died first and then rose again are in error because he rose first and then he died. He would have remained in Rome and presumably died at, in, at an advanced age. This history is not invented, it's not speculation. It is read from the Gospels and Acts by using this Pesha technique, which is shown to us or implied from the scrolls. 
the reader who knows it has expects inside information has exact knowledge of what terms mean he expects it to be perfectly accurate to be historically true to be consistent but he doesn't expect the supernatural jesus was made to suffer by religious fantasy bigotry and hatred in the name of holiness some of that fantasy still persists obscuring the message that jesus and his followers tried to put across two thousand years ago perhaps in a world come of age we may be at the point where all of us can learn what the real sense of christianity is without the miracle stories the children's stories or it may be that we have arrived at a point of such diversity that we can't go back to a language that was current in the Hellenistic period. Perhaps we've gone beyond it. But at any rate, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we really can now, for the first time, find the historical Jesus. And he's been there in the New Testament all the time. But Barbara Thearing's challenging arguments and careful researches may not be easily accepted, either by members of the established church or the current band of scholars. There are still a very large amount of Dead Sea Scrolls unpublished, and we don't know what they contain. And all our theories, even mine, must be preceded and followed by question marks until at least uh, we have all the relevant evidence. This area of scroll study, the identification of people and dates in the scrolls, if not a minefield, is full of exploded theories. In fact, the dating and identification of the teacher has been a kind of academic football that has been kicked about from one date to another for the last 40 years. No scholar agrees with any other scholar precisely as to the details of the history of the Qumran community, uh, beyond saying that there was a teacher of righteousness who may have been persecuted at some time. Barbara Thieling also has the disadvantage of being in Australia. It doesn't help. Um, Qumran studies migrate between Israel and America, with Europe lying conveniently between them. And so if, if you are on that axis, you're all right. If you're in Australia, it is rather difficult and scholars have not had the advantage of uh, discussing her views with her, except in print. The question is, should these discoveries be dismissed as destructive and irrelevant, or do they help us to a new and better understanding of Christianity? It's a question to which only you can provide the answer in your own personal way. That is the riddle of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Next Monday at one o'clock, a profile of the unconventional Bishop of Durham in Joker in the Pack. This week, Pope John Paul II arrives in Australia to attend celebrations and ceremonies associated with the beatification of Mary McKillop. Join Christina Kachukas on Thursday for highlights of the papal visit and the historic beatification mass, Thursday night at 9.30. Next, our movie, Helter Skelter.